All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mark Pipovetsky, and I'm a professor of Slavic at Columbia University. And uh, today, I'm very happy to... I, I, can, I can hear my... Uh, so, and I'm very happy to, to open the lecture and then the following discussion by Alexei Yurchak, a prominent anthropologist and an expert in, in various things. But today he will be talking about Lenin's body, the one that is in mausoleum and not only there. Um, uh, I'm happy to introduce Alexei, but, but before I get carried away, I want to um, explain a little bit the format of this presentation. So as if you are seeing us, you, you have joined uh, our YouTube channel um, and um, therefore you can see and hear us, I hope. Uh, you can also post questions through the YouTube chat and you can do it during uh, Alexei's presentation. They want to distract him, uh, Carly Jackson, our um, moderator and our chief uh, organizer of this event, she will be processing these questions and uh, we will prepare them for Alexei to answer after his uh, talk is finished. And the talk will be about 50 minutes and then we'll have, I guess, as, as much time as we need, but no more than 40, 45 minutes for uh, questions, maybe less, depends on questions, right? Um, so, uh, Alexei, we are very happy to have Alexei Uchak here uh, at what Alexei suggested to call the Pandemic Central. So we were planning um, his lecture at the Harriman Institute uh, before the pandemic started. And of course, it had to be canceled, but uh, this loss was, was unbearable. And uh, Alexei kindly agreed to deliver his lecture through uh, the invisible channels of the internet. So the lecture happens and uh, I'm sure that it will be exciting as it would be in person. So Alexei Yurchak is, is one of the most important uh, figures in contemporary uh, anthropology of so the Soviet Union and Russia in general. Um, a few years ago, I was co-editing uh, a special issue of the very respected uh, journal in Slavic studies, uh, and it was dedicated to the comparison of nonconformist cultures in the 60s, 70s versus 2000s, uh, 2010s. And there was a call for papers and uh, pretty strong competition, and eventually we had about 20 articles. And when uh, me and my co editor were preparing these articles for publication, we realized, we just noticed that. Each and every article had a reference to Alexei, Alexei's book, uh, and the book is uh, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More, The Last uh, Soviet Generation. The book has been published in 2006 in, uh, at the Princeton University Press, and then in 2015, um, Alexei prepared the, the uh, Russian version of this book, and later on it, it has been translated into, into multiple languages, including Japanese, Korean, Chinese, Czech, and Spanish. Um, and uh, it at first caused a, a big discussion, um, but eventually it, it has been acknowledged and accepted as, as basically the new vocabulary to, to describe late Soviet culture. And Alexei's ideas about the performative term in late Soviet culture, about uh, living near, living outside, so which, which, which he describes as the common way of living in the late Soviet society. His uh, description, definition of stop, of publics of Svayi, all this uh, and many other concepts, they, they really became the, the cornerstones of our current today's understanding of late Soviet culture. So it, 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 was, it was a revolutionary book by, by all means. And furthermore, Alexei proved that these categories and this vocabulary is very much applicable to the Western culture. In 2015, he wrote uh, an article about uh, Western versions of Stop 
in which he uh, arrived to the conclusion that basically the rise of stock that 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 he saw in Stephen Colbert or other similar cultural phenomena of the onion um, is uh, also the signifier of the petrification of the ruling ideology, petrification similar to what uh, was happening in late Soviet culture. And uh, here we are uh, observing the, the results of this petrification. Um, but uh, today, uh, Alexei will be talking about something very different and something that is associated with, the, uh, with his new book uh, and the book uh, that has been under contract with Princeton University Press. And uh, I understand that it, it has been completed or almost completed. And the book's title is Bodies of Lenin, Biochemistry of Communist Future. In this book, as as already said, uh, uh, Alexei explores Lenin's body. He forbade me to use the word mommy. He says that, that that's no, no. And I'm trying not to use it. Uh, the body sitting in mausoleum and the entire culture and science surrounding the, the, this fantastic artifact. Um, Alexei uh, did lots of field work and he um, did field work in the laboratory directly associated with the maintenance of the body with the mausoleum laboratory that has been created back in the uh, early 1920s. He, he studied archives and not only uh, in Russia but also in, in Prague and Sofia where there were also mausoleums of their political leaders and lots of exchange, uh, scientific and political and cultural was happening around it. So, so that's one aspect of his research, um, the snapshot of which he will, he will give to us today. The other aspect is even more important. Uh, Alexei offers a very important and uh, insightful conceptualization of uh, this uh, experiment. Uh, and uh, this conceptualization, as you will see, is both theoretical and symbolic. So I think that, that I, I have al already overstepped my limits and uh, I'd rather fade away uh, into the nothingness of the internet presentation and leave the central stage for Alexei Yurchak. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for such an extensive introduction. Didn't expect it. And um, thanks very much to the Harriman, to Carly Jackson for helping uh, set it up. Um, I didn't expect to give the, this talk, but now we, we've all been used to giving them. So it's, it's one of my few ones which I've given so far. Um, I would like now to probably jump in, but, but before I will share my screen, right? Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Yes, okay. So as you see, this is the title, Laboratory of the Future, Lenin's Body Between Biochemistry and Art. Just a little checkup. Is the sound okay, the volume? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so what kind of a body is lying in the mausoleum in Moscow? Is this the real body of Lenin? Um, let me just check, check there. A wax figurine or an imposter. Rumors that this body is fake have circulated since 1924. In the days after Lenin's death, his body lay in state in the House of Unions, where enormous crowds gathered to bid farewell to the leader. The experience of an endless line slowly filing past the body reminded some visitors of the crowds that gathered in the Panoptican Museum in St. Petersburg just a few years previously to see a wax effigy of the Egyptian Empress Cleopatra lying in a glass sarcophagus. Like Cleopatra, Lenin was rumored to be made of wax. When Lenin's body was permanently installed in the mausoleum in late summer 1924, Moscow was again awash with rumors that this was an artificial model. The rumors didn't disappear even in the, in the 1930s when repeating them could get one arrested. These speculations were regularly repeated in Western newspapers. To dispel them, in the 1930s, the party invited a group of Western newsmen to visit the mausoleum. An American journalist wrote that Boris Barsky, one of Lenin's two original embalmers, quote, opened the hermetically sealed glass case, tweaked Lenin's nose and turned his, turned his head to the right and left, demonstrating that it was not wax, it was Lenin, unquote. Such rumors have never completely died because they seemed believable. 
for some, the smooth, sallow skin of Lenin's body, glowing in the light, um, easily brings to mind the wax celebrities that populate Madame Tussauds Museum and its many imitations around the world. For others, such rumors are credible because they seem cynically rational. Why bother with maintaining Lenin's body, goes the argument, if creating its perfect wax replica would do the trick. In years since the Soviet collapse, rumors about Lenin's body being a fake have intensified. In the 1990s, Elias Barsky, son of the original embalmer and himself a longtime member of the embalming team, wrote, quote, I worked in the mausoleum for 18 years, and I know for a fact that Lenin's body is in a very good condition. All sorts of rumors and fabrications according to which this is not Lenin's body but an effigy, or that nothing but Lenin's face and hands have been successfully preserved, have no foundation in reality." Unquote. But this statement didn't kill the rumors either. In 2008, during debates in the Duma about the possible fate of Lenin's body, Vladimir Medinsky, then a Duma deputy and later Russia's Minister of Culture, made a claim that Lenin's body was inauthentic for a different reason. He said, quote, do not fool yourselves with the illusion that what is lying in the mausoleum is Lenin. What's left there is only 10% of his body, unquote. The respected political weekly Vlast decided to check this figure. During the autopsy and initial embalming, wrote the weekly, Lenin's brain, heart, and other internal organs were removed and no liquids in his body were replaced with embalming solutions. <clears throat> the internal organs and liquids together constitute about 77% of the human's body mass. Therefore, the journalist concluded, ironically, Deputy Medinsky had gotten it wrong. What is lying in the mausoleum is 23% of Lenin's body, not 10% as he had suggested. These persistent rumors and ironic comments are interesting not in themselves, but as an indication of the widely shared suspicion that the Soviet state had been always more interested not in appealing to real Lenin, but in constructing his imaginary figure. And if one analyzed the material composition of Lenin's body more closely, one would see that this suspicion uh, is not altogether unfounded. The task of the mausoleum lab has always been to focus on preserving not just the biological matter of this body, but what I call its dynamic form, which includes its physical look, shape, color, weight, and also its suppleness, firmness, flexibility. Lenin died 96 years ago, but his body remains supple, the skin is elastic, and all the joints are flexible. In the Soviet times, special commissions of scientists and party leaders regularly examined this body and compared their observations with the previous examinations. To the gaze of the political leadership, this body appeared to be dynamic and even improving with time. However, to regular visitors to the mausoleum, the body always looked static, immobile, frozen in a distant moment. Regular visitors see it lying in the sarcophagus dressed in a dark suit with only its head and hands exposed. The existence of these two distinct regimes of visibility, I argue, one of, uh, for the gaze of the political regime and the other for common citizens, suggests that the political role of Lenin's body was always greater than that of a simple propaganda symbol designed to boost popular support for the Soviet state. This body also played a different political role that was important for the symbolic structuring of the regime itself. To understand what this political role was, we must first return to the period just before Lenin's death. In spring 1922, Lenin fell ill and left Moscow for the country's estate of Gorky. In the next several months, he had three strokes and eventually lost the ability to speak, read and write, and most of his motor functions. The party leadership introduced strict rules isolating Lenin from political life. They reflected a real concern for Lenin's health but they also were an attempt to neutralize a powerful political rival. Professor Viktor Osipov, a member of Lenin's medical team, remembered, quote, during the uh, that final period of his illness, starting in spring 1923, Lenin saw himself as a person who had been removed from the list of active political figures, unquote. While the Politburo was isolating the living Lenin from the political world, it was simultaneously engaged in canonizing Lenin's public image. In early 1923, more than a year prior to Lenin's death, and in spite of his active objections, 
the party leadership launched the term Leninism, Leninism into public circulation and introduced the rituals of pledging party allegiance to it. Under the su supervision of the Central Committee, Lenin Institute was established in Moscow. Lenin was now being actively constructed as an object of, polit of political iconography that was connected with the actual living Lenin only tangentially. Several times during his illness, Lenin's condition improved considerably and he was capable of reading, writing and communicating again. However, much of what Lenin was saying and writing after the fall of 1922 was pointedly erased from his constructed image. When in January 1923, Lenin sent an article, How We Should uh, Reorganize Arab Krin, this is the Workers and Peasants Inspection, to newspaper Pravda, Bukharin and Stalin tried to block its publication, and Kuybyshev suggested printing a single copy of Pravda with the article just for Lenin, while printing the regular run of the paper without it. After the deliberations, the article was published in the regular version of Pravda. However, the Politburo also sent a letter to regional party committees explaining that Lenin's illness prevented him from being up to date and, this and that his article didn't represent the party position. Lenin, the political figure, was now doubled into one Lenin who was banished from the political world and another Lenin who was canonized within that world. The first Lenin lived in Gorky estate, the second one dwelled in Lenin Institute in Moscow. In November 1923, Pravda wrote that Lenin was not just the name of a beloved leader, but something bigger, a program, a tactic, a philosophical worldview in the word Leninism. Leninism was, uh, as a teaching was bigger than the flesh and blood person called Lenin and could be even different from him. As we know, historians have observed that Lenin's cult status, I don't quite like the word cult in relation to Lenin, but nevertheless, we can discuss. Lenin's cult status preceded his death. This is true. However, we must add to this observation another important point. It was not just Lenin's cult that preceded his death, but the doubling of Lenin into canonized and banished figures. It was as a result of these two simultaneous processes, canonization and banishment, that the Russian revolutionary state in the 1920s was transformed into a Leninist polity. After that time, the relationship between Leninism and Lenin always remained distorted, unpredictable, and continuously changing. In 1936, famous Soviet writer Marieta Shaginyan published a novel, The Ulyanov's Family, which included previously unknown facts of Lenin's private life, family, and ethnic origin. The Politburo reacted immediately, adopting a resolution that reprimanded Shaginyan and banned the book. The harsh language of the resolution called Shaginyan's book politically harmful and ideologically hostile. It also condemned Lenin's widow, Nadezhda Krupskaya, for not only failing to stop the novel's publication, but even assisting Shigenyan in every way possible. What made the behavior of Krupskaya and Shigenyan, quote, particularly intolerable and tactless, concluded the resolution, was that they worked on the book, quote, without the knowledge and approval of the Central Committee, unquote. They presented themselves as interpreters of Lenin's life, while the only true interpreter was the Central Committee of the Party. The resolution ended with a ruling. Publishing any works about Lenin without the knowledge and sanction of the Central Committee is forbidden, unquote. In 1938, this final statement became an official ruling, verbatim, for all publishing houses, houses and institutions of censorship. Since the 1920s, central, uh, the central role of controlling the corpus of texts by and about Lenin was played by Lenin Institute, a branch of the Central Committee. The job of the Institute was to prepare, research, and publish Lenin's works and commentaries to them. The main project was always to prepare the multi-volume, full collection of Lenin's works. Between 1920s and 1966, five versions of Lenin's full collections were published each different from the others in number, in the number of volumes, the documents included and omitted, and the type of editing and censorship to which they were subjected. Vladimir Masolov, who worked in Lenin Institute between 1956 and 1991 as an expert in Marxist-Leninism, describes a profound contradiction at the basis of the Institute's activities. As a research facility, the Institute indeed studied Lenin's works in depth, engaged in their critical analysis, 
and provided in-depth commentary and referential materials. But as an ideological tool of the Central Committee, the Institute had also uh, used Lenin's texts to grant legitimacy to every new party policy, including decisions that contradicted the previous ones. In public discourse, Leninism was presented as fixed and unchanging, as the enunciation of the foundational and unquestionable truth of the Soviet project. In practice, however, every new period of Soviet history saw the construction of a new version of Leninism. The process of editing and changing the corpus of Leninist texts was ongoing. In the article entitled Against Distortions of Leninism in December 1931, Pravda wrote that Lenin's works needed to be thoroughly reviewed and cleared of all counter-revolutionary references and interpretations. These texts were revised according to the updated 1930s version of what counter-revolutionary reviews and persons meant. In 1938, Lenin Institute prepared a manual on publishing additional Lenin's works, which was sent to editors and censors around the country. If Lenin co-authored an important document with someone who was now discovered to be an enemy, that document could be attributed to Lenin as the sole author. Sometimes even texts that were not written by Lenin were also attributed to him. And texts that suggested any past disagreement between Lenin and Stalin had to be either edited or omitted altogether. After Stalin's death and the denunciation of his, of his cult of personality and crimes, the Institute continued to edit and change Lenin's texts, now according to new principles. Historian Friedrich Firsov, who worked in the Institute from 57 to 91, participated in the preparation for the, of the fifth edition of Lenin's collected works that was published in the 1960s. That edition was supposed to be the most comprehensive comprehensive and accurate collection of Lenin's works ever published that would overcome all the distortions of Lenin's thought that had been performed in Stalin's years. However, in fact, the fifth edition continued to alter, censor, and exclude Lenin's texts. There were several principles according to which this work was conducted. Uh, texts could be omitted if the, they contradicted the current party policy in the 1960s if it could be read as a critique of the Soviet system that developed after Lenin's death, if it demonstrated Lenin's personal ruthlessness to some individuals and groups, if it suggested that Lenin made mistakes or wrong judgments, if it alluded to Lenin's extramarital affair with Ines Armand, and finally, if it described Lenin's illness in too much detail. These editorial techniques that were practiced throughout the Soviet history were part of the two simultaneous processes to which I uh, referred earlier as canonization of Lenin in the political world and his banishment from that world. The result of these two processes was the continuous production of Leninism as the unquestionable and foundational truth of the Soviet project. The process of re-editing and reshaping Lenin's texts was paralleled by the, by the procedures of re-embalming and re-sculpting Lenin's body. When Lenin died in January 1924, no plans to preserve his body existed. Professor Abrikosov conducted the autopsy and temporarily embalmed Lenin's body so that it could be displayed in an open coffin for, for the five days of the public farewell. Lenin's body lay in state in the House of Unions in Moscow with huge crowds of people from all over the country waiting to bid farewell to the leader in an endless line in extremely cold temperatures. In January, 1927, uh, I mean, in January 27, 1924, uh, Lenin's body was buried in the temporary wooden mausoleum that was quickly built on the Red Square near the tomb. Oops, I'm sorry, I just, my text just jumped. One second. Uh, on the Red Square near the tomb of the fallen uh, revolutionaries. The body showed no signs of decomposition, in part due to long periods of extremely cold temperature that winter, below minus 20 Celsius. The body lay for a few weeks longer in a sarcophagus with two glass windows, here's on the picture on the right, opposite Lenin's face, allowing more people to see the body before it would be finally closed and lowered into the ground. The body was now in an intermediary state. The burial that began on January 27th had not yet been completed its final st stage still pending. The winter and spring of 1924 in Moscow continued to be extremely cold and the commissions that examined the body several 
after several days between late January and late March, reported no major signs of the decomposition. But in late March, the weather turned warmer and soon the first threatening signs of irreversible transformation were noticed. The extended period of two, weeks, of, of two months from late January to late March, during which the body remained in good condition, gave the party leadership a chance to discuss its fate in many meetings and from different perspectives. It was during these discussions that the idea to preserve and display the body for a long time, perhaps for posterity, gradually won over. At first, many party leaders felt that this idea was counter-revolutionary. Trotsky and a few others opposed it as an attempt to create a, quote, religious relic, something which no materialist could accept. Others argued that while it was important to build the grand public memorial for Lenin, his body should be buried in it in a closed tomb. But to the third group, it seemed important to continue displaying Lenin's body, at least for some time, allowing more people from around the world to pay their respects. The party leaders were obviously not of one mind. At the decisive meeting on March 5, 1924, Leonid Krasin, an important figure in the Central Committee, who had an engineering degree, suggested preserving Lenin's body in a metal box with a glass top and, quote, filling it all, all the way up to the brim with embalming liquid that would be absolutely transparent and invisible from outside, unquote. But Felix Dzerzhinsky, chairman of the Funeral Commission, disagreed. Instead of submerging the body in, in liquid, he said, as some kind of dead meat, it would be better to freeze it. However, several members of the commission pointed out that freezing the body had its problems too. It would preserve not only the body, but also all of its current defects, while liquid embalming might allow one to fix them later. Another member of the Central Committee, Vyacheslav Molotov, opposed both freezing the body and submerging it in liquid, but he had no alternative suggestions. Dr. Maximilian Savelyev proposed putting the body in a transparent capsule filled with pure nitrogen, neutral gas that would prevent biological processes and stop decomposition. However, Krasin, who, as I said, had an engineering degree, was skeptical. I have my doubts, he said. As far as I know, apart from the bacteria that live in oxygen, there are also anaerobic bacteria that successfully function, function in nitrogen. Having listened to these opinions, Avil Yunukidze, member of the Central Executive Committee, summarized. We should certainly understand that we will not be able to preserve Vladimir Ilyich for a long time. We will freeze the body without promising to anyone that this is done for posterity. If disaster strikes and it continues changing even when it is frozen, we will have to enclose it." Unquote. But then Klement Varashilov, member of the Revolutionary Military Council, made the final suggestion. I propose doing nothing. If the body holds up for another year without change, this is already good enough." Unquote. In late March, it was actually decided to try an experimental embalming procedure proposed by Professor of Medicine Vladimir Vorobyov from Kharkov and by a chemist from Moscow, Boris Zbarsky. Neither of them was certain that the experiment would succeed. Vorobyov, Zbarsky, and their three assistants worked for four months and in late July 1924, reported to the leadership of their success. They didn't simply embalm Lenin's body once and for all, but developed a dynamic method of preservation. It required regularly re-embalming the body, taking it out of this sarcophagus, submerging it for weeks in baths with different solutions, filling it, filling it with new substances, re-sculpting its shapes and surfaces, and so on. If Lenin's body was regularly treated according to this method, Vorobyov and Zbarsky said, it would be preserved for quite a long time, perhaps indefinitely. Following this report on July 24th, 1924, the Commission for the Eternalization of Lenin's Memory issued a public statement. We didn't want to turn the body of Vladimir Ilyich into some kind of relic by means of which we could popularize and preserve his memory. He had already immortalized himself enough with his brilliant teaching and revolutionary activities. Instead, we wanted to preserve the body of Vladimir Ilyich because it is of great importance to preserve the physical appearance of this remarkable leader for the next generation and all the future generations. This retrospective statement and the debates about the fate of Lenin's body that had gone on for several months earlier 
which I mentioned, suggests that the body was increasingly seen by the party leaders in two distinct ways. This duality reflected how the party leadership had treated Lenin in the final months of his life, when the flesh and blood Lenin was banished from political life and the newly constructed Lenin of Leninism was canonized within it. Now Lenin's body was treated in the same dual way. It was officially buried, but continued to be displayed. It was preserved for an indefinite future, but not as it was argued in this statement to commemorate a concrete person. The body was now two things at once. It was the corpse of Lenin and also the embodiment of something that was different from Lenin and bigger than him. This way of thinking about Lenin's body in 1924 is strikingly similar to how the scientists of the mausoleum lab talk about it, their work today. Valery Bikov, director of the institute where mausoleum lab is housed, it's called Ilar, um, describes the main task of this body as the preservation of Lenin's anatomical image, anatomicky obras. This phrase implies a particular focus on the body in which maintaining the physical form and appearance of the body as a whole is of greater significance than preserving its original biomatter. Professor uh, Yuri Mikhailovich Lopuhin, um, you see it, uh, for several decades, a leading member of the group that maintained Lenin's body, described to me the uniqueness of this body by using the phrase living sculpture, Jovaya Scriptura, that he coined himself. The phrase is Lopuhin's attempt to capture a number of ambiguities about this body. After years of being re-embalmed and re-sculpted, the body has changed so much that it can be seen as a representation of Lenin's body rather than the body itself. At the same time, however, stresses Lopuhin, unlike sculpture or painting, this is clearly not an external representation, but the actual body itself. The phrase living sculpture is an attempt to capture this ambiguity. It refers to a body that both is and is not a representation, as if to say that this is a sculpture of the body that is constructed out of the body itself. To continuously re-sculpt uh, the form and dynamic properties of Lenin's body, explains Lepuhin, quote, one must know the basics of anatomy, physical chemistry, and how to maintain the water balance. One must also possess an artistic sense. This is why not everyone is capable of doing this work, unquote. Another veteran scientist of the lab, Professor Vladislav Kazeltsev, also in the picture, makes a similar point. During uh, major re-embalming and reconstructing procedures, he explains, every new wrinkle, cavity, and protrusion in this body must be fixed. We're talking about tiny dim dimensions. Some amount of artificial sub uh, substitutes has to be introduced, which is quite difficult. One needs experience and artistic sense to perform this work. During the Soviet period, party commissions and scientists regularly examined Lenin's body and issued detailed reports on its condition. On January 19th, 1939, the report of the Commission of the People's Commissariat of Health for the examination of Lenin's body stressed that, quote, the elasticity of the eyelids had been preserved and the face was in good condition in general, making the complete impression of a sleeping person rather than a corpse. But there were also some problems that needed attention. The commission found new spots on the outer side of the left forearm and on the soles and toes on, on the feet, uh, where it noticed some signs of mummification. Also in the pelvic area, there are hints of wrinkling and thinning of the skin. One reason for the development of such wrinkles, cavities and spots in the skin in the dead body is hydrolysis, the process in which solid fats in the skin liquefy and move away from their locations. And of course that changes the look. To solve this problem, the lab developed a unique artificial material, a mix of paraffin, glycerin and carotene that has physical properties of organic fats, but unlike fats is chemically neutral and doesn't under undergo hydrolysis. The new material is, in, is applied in liquid form by microinjections to the surfaces of Lenin's body where depression or change of volume was found. When the material cools, it, it hardens and can be easily sculpted to reconstruct precisely the micro landscape of the surface. 
This treatment has been ongoing with original fat cells continually replaced with artificial materials in rich tissue, in, in different tissues in the body. Observing this procedure, People's Commissar of Health, Mitiryov, during that examination, asked the imbalance. Does it mean that after a period of time, all fats in the body will be replaced with this artificial mass? Spassky answered positively, which satisfied Mitiryov and the other members of the commission. For the party, uh, uh, scientists uh, and uh, leaders substituting substituting original biological matter with artificial materials was not a problem, as long as the form of the body, including its look, shapes, volumes, and dynamic characteristics was precisely reconstructed. So what was the political role of maintaining Lenin's body in this way? This role becomes clearer if we compare Lenin's body with the bodies of sovereign rulers in other disconnected cultural and historical contexts. This comparative method, I think, is very important. Western European kings famously analyzed by Ernst Kantarovich provide a useful point of departure. Kantarovich focused on late medieval and early modern legal theories of sovereignty uh, in the monarchy, in the absolutist monarchy, that linked it with the king's body. We should remind ourselves that sovereign power is absolute not only spatially within sovereign borders, but also temporally. It is able to reproduce itself perpetually, surviving the demise of any concrete bearer of sovereignty. But what is the mechanism of this reproduction and in what material form is the perpetuity of sovereignty invested? When these questions became suddenly important for the political and theological reasons in late medieval Christian Europe, they led to the development of a legal doctrine of the king's two bodies. With the shift towards a new secularized model of monarchy in the 16th and 17th centuries, the king's legitimacy was no longer based on the approval and consecration by the church but was now purely dynastic, coming not from grace, but from nature. Kantarovich writes that uh, royal qualities and potencies were now seen as natural traits that dwelt directly in the king's blood, creating a royal species of man. According to this understanding, the physical body of the king, unlike that of regular mortals, was doubled, consisting of two bodies that coexisted with one within one flesh, a mortal body or body of nature, and an immortal body, or body of grace. A king's death was the demise of his mortal body, but the immortal body survived his death and after a period of the interregnum, re-inhabited the flesh of the next king. During the interregnum, the doubling of the monarch's body acquired an explicitly material manifestation, which came to be reflected in the construction of the monarch's effigy. The effigy looked uncannily similar to the deceased monarch, but this was not simply his or her external representation. We know that sculptures and images of the dead are common in many funeral ceremonies around the world, but usually they function as representations of the dead, that is, as substitutes for the missing corpse. But the royal effigy was different. It appeared only for a short period of time before enduring the funeral, and it always coexisted in space and time with the displayed corpse of the monarch instead of substituting for the corpse. Together, the corpse and an effigy as a pair manifested the material doubling of the monarch's body, and they only appeared as a pair. Effigies were made to look, um, to look uh, like an exact healthy version of the monarch. So exact, in fact, that sometimes even members of the court mistook the effigy for the living king. Great artistic efforts went into producing effigies. They were made of wax, leather, and wood. Their faces were meticulously modeled on the death mask of the monarch, and they were carefully painted to look as live as possible. Often real hair was used, artificial eyelashes were inserted, and limbs were created with moving joints. The effigy was dressed in the monarch's clothes and seated on the throne. Medics pretended to take its pulse and listen to its breath. It was served food and wine, and after meals, its mouth and hands were wiped. With the coronation of the next monarch, the two royal bodies became once again reunited within one flesh. The corpus of the previous king, the corpse of the previous king was buried, and the effigy was hidden or destroyed. Kandarovich described the theory of the king's two bodies as an artifact of the late medieval, early modern Catholic Christian Europe. 
However, anthropologists and historians have described many comparable rituals in different sociocultural and historical contexts. The third edition of Sir James Fraser's famous The Golden Bow, published in 1916, describes the ritual of royal succession in the Shuluk Kingdom in southern Sudan, which in some detail, including the ritual of doubling uh, of the royal body and the use of a wooden effigy, also echo those described by Kantarovich in medieval Europe. Comparable cosmologies and rituals developed in many parts of the world, from West Africa to East India, and from pre-modern Japan to ancient Imperial Rome, and also the Vatican. In many disconnected contexts around the world, it appears that the temporal discontinuity between the impermanence of the physical body of the sovereign and the permanence of the office of the sovereign produced comparable cosmologies and rituals of bodily doubling. The case explored by Kantarovich then was a significant instance of a much broader phenomenon. In the Soviet Leninist system, a distinct political cosmology that linked the physical body of the founder with the perpetual sovereign power of the regime had also emerged. This political cosmology not only influenced the decision to preserve Lenin's body for posterity, but also shaped a particular manner in which the preservation of the body was performed and what scientific practices were designed to achieve it. The Leninist model of sovereignty, however, didn't develop as a direct genealogical transformation from the previous Russian monarchy. Michael Chernyavsky, a student of Kantarovich, pointed out that no doctrine comparable to that of the king's two bodies ever developed in the Russian monarchy. However, this didn't prevent the emergence of a comparable model of sovereign perpetuity in the Bolshevik communist state after Lenin's death. This development was encouraged by the modern revolutionary ethos that focused on the sovereign body as a central site of revolutionary transformation. The Bolsheviks imagined themselves as to the French Revolution. They saw the communist project in terms of uh, severing all links with the traditional past and opening itself completely to the future. Philosopher Claude Lefort demonstrated that in modern liberal democracies, the political institution of sovereignty is directly linked to how sovereign power was organized in Europe's absolutist monarchies of the past. In the monarchy, the legitimacy of the sovereign was guaranteed by his or her link to what Lefort calls another place, a place that was external to the political world of the monarchy. That's where the foundational truth is located on the slide where the immortal perpetual foundational truth of the sovereign power was anchored. It was in that external place that the second immortal body of each monarch was uh, anchored or located. But in contemporary liberal democracy, argues Lefort, the external place where the center of sovereignty is anchored is now empty. Um, I'm sorry, I, again, my text jumped a little bit. Uh, is now empty. Um, no elected leader in a liberal democracy can occupy that place as the king once did. And every democratic leader must serve in the name of that empty place and must refer to it for legitimacy. Uh, in this external place, the unquestionable and foundational truth of the liberal democracy is located. It's marked here as founding fathers for the US audience, but doesn't have to be. This truth cannot be questioned in the political and legal language of the liberal state. In the US, for example, this is the place where the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are located. The latter describes the truth on which the state is founded as self-evident, as in the famous phrase, we take this truth to be self-evident. Recently, Eric Sandner, another philosopher from Chicago, also suggested that in liberal democracy, the center of sovereign power has migrated from the king's body to a new location. However, unlike Lefort, he defines that new location not as an ex external empty place, as on this slide, but as the extra personal body of the people or the nation. Lefort's and Sutton's argument at first glance appear to be different from each other. However, in fact, they are complementary. Taken together, they demonstrate exactly how the sovereign body in modern liberal democracy is doubled. The first body is what Sutton calls the extra personal body of the population. And the second body is what Lefort refers to as this foundational truth that is anchored outside in this external place, outside the polity. Comparing the structures of sovereign power in the monarchy and in liberal democracy, as I just did, is helpful 
for understanding how sovereign power was organized in the Leninist state, in the Soviet Leninist polity. It appears that sovereignty here was organized as a peculiar combination of these two systems. On the one hand, unlike the king in the monarchy, no acting Soviet leader, not even Stalin, could occupy the center of sovereign power. The relation of every Soviet leader to the sovereign power was always mediated by the figure of Leninism. Every Soviet leader was granted legitimacy if it could be demonstrated that he was a faithful Leninist. And any leader was delegitimized in an instant if it was shown that he violated Leninism. Two paradigmatic events of Soviet history illustrate this point. First, the emergence of Stalin's unique personality cult. And second, the complete collapse of that cult after his death. Importantly, neither of these events led to the collapse of the party and the Soviet state. At first, Stalin was celebrated as the most faithful Leninist who had unique access to truth. But after his death in 1953, Stalin was accused of precisely the opposite, of having violated Leninism and distorted truth. Despite Lenin's enormous personal power, he, like all other Soviet leaders, didn't, despite Stalin's enormous personal power, he, like all other Soviet leaders, did not occupy the center of sovereignty. That center was located in the external truth of Leninism, but who was the agent of that sovereignty? And what was the political, what was the position of Lenin's body in relation to that agent? To answer these questions, we need to bring in another analysis that is related to this discussion. Political philosopher Ken Jovit showed that in the Leninist system, the agent of sovereign power was neither a traditional charismatic leader, like the king uh, or the Führer in the Nazi state, nor the depersonalized modern bureaucracy as in local, as in liberal democratic state. Instead, the agent of sovereign power in the Soviet system was a unique new institution that was organized as an unlikely mixture of the monarchy and liberal democracy. This institute was the Leninist party. And Jovit calls it neo-traditional because it emerged when two seemingly incompatible principles were absorbed into one organizational structure. First, the traditional principle of individual heroism, individual heroism, and second, the modern principle of organizational impersonalism. So in the Leninist system, the heroic agent was not an individual, but the party. This was an agent who, whose heroism was defined in organizational, not individual terms. Joe calls this principle of political organization charismatic impersonalism. Leninist party was founded upon and held together by the foundational truth known as the correct line. Every leader in the Leninist system claimed authority on the basis of his knowledge of the correct line, and no leader could question that line. As we saw, um, after Lenin's death, the correct line was articulated continuously in terms of Leninism. So combining Jovit's argument with those which I mentioned earlier, Lefort and Santner, um, we can clarify the structure of sovereign, how sovereign power was organized in the Soviet Leninist state. The agent of that sovereign power here that was uh, collective and impersonal was the Leninist party. In other words, every single member of the party, every single leader of the party could be found to be wrong and in violation of Leninism, but the party as a whole was always already correct and right. Uh, the body of the collective impersonal agent, like the body of every sovereign, was indeed doubled into the model and immodel bodies. The model body was the collection of all members of the party whose ongoing succession enabled the continuous regeneration of the party as an institution. The model body was located outside of the Soviet system in the place of this Leninist anchor, the unquestionable foundational truth which couldn't be transcended or questioned. Despite being unquestionable and foundational, Leninism, in fact, was constantly reshaped and rearranged, as I showed earlier. This process involved not only editing and censoring Lenin's texts, but also re-embalming and re-sculpting Lenin's body. The body was literally doubled within itself, functioning like a combination of two bodies, a corpse, mortal biological remains, and an effigy, a mortal physical form that was constantly reconstructed and reshaped. Professor Lapuhin's phrase, which I quoted earlier, living sculpture, in fact captures this internal doubling quite perfectly. To maintain Lenin's body in this manner, it, is, it has been continuously subjected to many special procedures. Some of these procedures are repeated daily, 
some weekly and the most elaborate and lengthy are repeated every one and a half years and take two months to complete. These are known as big procedures. During big procedures, all embalming liquids are drained from the body and subjected to a variety of biochemical, anatomical and physical tests to identify any changes in their composition that might indicate what processes had been going on in the body since the previous embalming. Then the body is submerged for substantial periods of time in baths with different solutions. Samples of different tissues in the body are collected and tested. Hundreds of photographs of the body's surfaces are taken with precision cameras and compared to photographs that had been taken previously. Microinjections of artificial substances and applications of plastics and pastes and other inorganic materials are used to maintain and reconstruct body parts, surfaces, color weight, and dynamic characteristics, flexibility, suppleness, molecular structure of the skin, and so forth. In this process, the composition of the body is slowly changing. This work with this special set of goals led to the development of a unique subfield of biochemistry unlike any other. The experimental scientific procedures of this field have eventually exceeded the immediate project of maintaining Lenin's body and led to some remarkable innovations in other areas. Some of them have entered regular medicine and even found their way into global medical practice. I would like to focus on two of them. In the 1960s, uh, Yuri Lepuhin and a team of lab scientists worked on an improved method for maintaining the form and volume of different tissues in the preserved body. This method was a version of the so-called perfusion, which is a known method, uh, the flowing of liquids through capillary system of an organ that allows, for example, to maintain an organ structure vo volume and viability when an, an organ is taken out of the body of an organ donor for organ transplantation. The approach that Lepuhin developed in the lab, he and his team later adapted for the work on kidney transplantation in living patients. Although maintaining tissues in Lenin's dead body is not the same, obviously, as maintaining an organ for transplantation in a living body, some challenges that needed to be solved in both projects were similar. For example, it was necessary to design specialized tools and equipment that made different types of perfusion possible. In 1969, for this work on kidney transplantation that was partially linked to, to the mausoleum lab, Professor Lepuhin won the state prize of the USSR. Another important requirement of the work on Lenin's body is that the skin of the body should be damaged as little as possible. New cuts and punctures in the skin should be avoided, although some of them have to be performed. This is why the lab developed a number of non-invasive methods for testing the structures and layers in the skin of Lenin's body. This work also later informed general practice. Based on this invention, Lepuhin's team developed a non-invasive method for measuring cholesterol level in the skin of living patients. The method is known as a three-drop test. It involves putting a drop of a chemical agent on the surface of the palm where, where it enters into reaction with the cholesterol in the surface layers of the skin. Then a second drop of another chemical agent is applied to the same spot coming into reaction with the first solution and fixing it. And the third drop then is applied of the third agent and it changes the color of the solution. The exact hue of the color indicates the ratio of cholesterol in the solution and it could be easily measured with a simple spectrophotometer, even in home context. This method predicts the overall level of cholesterol in the body quite accurately because approximately 11% of the human body's cholesterol is contained in our skin. While one research focused on the dead body uh, and the other on living patients, both dealt with a problem that required non-invasive engagement with the surface layers of skin. In this way, Lenin's body could affect living patients. In 1992, um, an English language, Lepuhin and his colleagues described the three-drop test in an English language publication. And uh, in 2002, uh, they received the US patent for this invention. Canadian company Miraculins purchased the rights to this test and developed it further into an FDA-approved diagnostic test called Prévu. Today, this test in its later modifications are successfully marketed in Canada, Europe, and the United States as, as you see on the slide, the world's first and only non-invasive skin cholesterol test. But these promotional materials make no mention of Lenin's body. Okay. My conclusion. In her study of Lenin's uh, 
cult, quote unquote. Historian Nina Tumarkin famously suggested that the Bolshevik leadership pre uh, preserved Lenin's body to create a sacred relic that would continuously continue to legitimate uh, Soviet power and mobilize the population that was deeply orthodox, illiterate, and familiar with saints. However, if we look carefully at the materiality of this body, it becomes clear that to Marx's argument is quite problematic. And I, I, I can flesh that, this out in Q&A if, if there's interest. It has been also suggested that the de decision to preserve Lenin's body could have been influenced by Nikolai Fyodorov's philosophy of common cause that sought uh, human salvation in the physical resurrection of the flesh. This argument, however, is also problematic since the method of preserving Lenin's body, as I demonstrated, includes continuous substitution of its flesh with inorganic substances. The profoundly altered biomatter that has emerged in these manipulations would be quite incompatible with the human remains that further sought to resurrect. To understand what the political meaning of Lenin's body was in the Soviet system, it is crucial to investigate the dynamic materiality of this body the emerging condition of its tissues, cells, and joints, the procedures and tests to which it has been subjected, and the scientific practices that have developed around them. This body has played a central role in the structure of Soviet sovereign power. The center of sovereignty in the system was vested neither in the figure of the ruler, as in the monarchy or the Nazi state, nor in the abstract population, as in the modern liberal democracy, but in the collective and personal agent, the party. This agent transcended every one of its members, including its current leader. Each of them could be found, and often was found, to be wrong and illegitimate, but the party as a collective agent was always already legitimate and right. The sovereign position of this agent was guaranteed by the foundational truth of Leninism, to which the party had unique access. So you can see that the sovereign agent in that system was the, the impersonal collective figure of the party who acted as a, as a ventriloquist, it constructed the speaking dummy, the speaker figure uh, of Lenin and spoke through that figure in Leninist voice. This project emerged and became shaped gradually as part of a complex political cosmology that most participants, politicians and scientists did not necessarily see for its underlying cultural and political logic and didn't necessarily design to uh, play the role which I uh, point out here. The cultivation of Lenin's body in the Soviet period was always performed in strict secrecy behind closed doors, visible only to the gaze of the political leadership. The reason for this secrecy is the same as the reason for hiding constant manipulations to which Lenin's texts and thoughts had been subjected. This approach allowed for Leninism to appear as an independent, objective, and ahistorical truth that always remained the same despite sharp turns in the party policies over the decades. It allowed Lenin to appear as the legitimate source of the party actions instead of being, to a large extent, a product of these actions. With the demise of the party in the Soviet state in 1991, Lenin's body became severed from this complex political structure and lost its political role in the system of sovereignty. The new Russian state neither closed the mausoleum nor paid much attention to it. Today, the body remains on public display and the lab continues its work but it continues it mostly by inertia. To the scientists of the lab, this body having lost its original political meaning has remained nevertheless as a unique scientific experiment. This experimental body has never been static and fixed. It has always been dynamic, changing and emerging because of the same principles of preservation that still, go still govern this work, Lenin's body remained, remains doubled, a combination of a corpse and an effigy. This makes the rumors about its fake nature, the rumors with which I started this talk, in a peculiar way, both wrong and right at the same time. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm done with the talk. And Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexei. Mm. So, could, could, could you turn off the, the Sharing. presentation so that we could get to the dialogue? All right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So I will be the one who will be uploading, but I can tell you we have 111 listeners right now, and there are uh, many friendly names in this list, and uh, I'm addressing now uh, our big crowd. Please uh, type your 
questions in the live chat. And while you are doing this, uh, I will be using this moment to to ask my questions, um, just a few of them. Uh, so, so, so. Uh, once again, thank you very much. It, it is an exciting talk, and indeed, you showed that that Lenin's body is a extremely uh, fertile and uh, rich metaphor of of multiple meanings. And of course, you 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 highlighted many of them: and uh, mortal body of Lenin, mortal body of the party corpse, and effigy um, canonized and banished Lenin. We may say religious and uh, scientific, as you showed, scientific is, is a very prominent there, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you mentioned in the end of your uh, talk uh, that, that this, this uh, metaphor has been sort of not intentional, of course, right? It has been formed as such in the process of shaping and reshaping uh, of uh, the regime and the body, right? Uh, uh, my, my question is, is about the, the uh, and everything that you say about Lane's body sounds absolutely, uh, for me, 100% convincing. Uh, my question is about the immortal, uh, I'm sorry, mortal body of the party, right? And uh, I, I think that, that, that while uh, placing this into this equation, you um, sort of literalize this, the, 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 this uh, more or less religious mantra of the 1930s that the party is always right, right? And uh, in the period that, that you studied so well and the, the period that uh, I'm familiar well, uh, the, the, the party was a completely rhetorical object in the, in, in the 60s and 70s, right? However, the, the, the mortal body that was very much flexible and very much uh, living was the body of, uh, of power, of bureaucracy. Right, the body of what was called nomenclatura. Why, why are you preferring this, this highly um, vague and symbolic object of the party as opposed to, to more or less tangible and more or less um, active uh, figure of nomenclatura? And I think that if you make this choice, the role of Stalin or any other political leader would become much more clear because otherwise they're sort of in between. All right. Well, thank you for the question. First of all, um, you used the word metaphor in the beginning. Yes. Uh, I, I'm not using the analysis of this double body as a metaphor. It's not at all no. a metaphor. It's very literal material. Uh, so I wouldn't kind of um, try to refuse the word metaphor. Um, at the same time, why I'm using the party and uh, why I'm talking about a discourse of Leninism as the unquestionable truth, rather than going to concrete uh, people like nomenclatura trying to play with this language. Because um, there is one, structurally one uh, agent, which, which is an abstract agent, it is not anyone concretely, which cannot be transcended, which is always embodying the unquestionable. And that agent, which is the case in many political systems, and that question, uh, that agent is the party. Nomenclatura has to reproduce uh, certain maxims, regardless of what people believe. I mean, of course, uh, in real life, in late socialism, people play with this language, but they cannot question it. The, what I spoke about in my previous book as the authoritative discourse, it stands for the unquestionable truth. You have to question. You, you have to repeat it in order to be able to say everything else. And uh, you don't need to believe it. When I say the unquestionable truth, I, I don't mean that people believe it necessarily. But they have to question. Uh, they cannot question it publicly. There is no political discourse within which you can question it. Uh, there, there is a discourse of dissidents, a discourse of uh, kuchny, and so forth. But that it doesn't become a public pol political language until perestroika. So um, there is this one uh, horizon of the transcendental truth, which cannot be questioned, which is why for me, this abstract figure of the party is important and the figure of Leninism is important because without having those uh, uh, abstract figures, which embody the, uh, the unquestionable, you cannot really analyze the whole system of sovereign power you know, in order to understand how it is structured. Um, nomenclatura is, um, uh, the group of people, a large group of people, 
uh, in the leadership of the party, in the Central Committee, in different positions. And all of them together, each of them uh, uh, individually can be seen uh, as a violating principles of the party, uh, being wrong about something, being criticized, being purged, um, being actually kicked out of the party, and all sorts of things. But the collective uh, uh, abstract body cannot be. The party cannot be questioned. When it was questioned around 1988, uh, already seriously during the strike, the whole thing collapsed. So th this abstract entity cannot be questioned. And I'm interested in that entity in order to understand how it works, how the sovereign power works. So nomenclatura is not that entity. So, so, so it, it all happens within the realm of symbolic language. I don't know what you mean by symbolic language, to be honest. Uh, no, it, it, no it, it doesn't all happen within the realm of symbolic language. Without the realm of symbolic language and the le level of material analysis of practices, you will not be able to analyze it. It, it, it happens in both. And I sh showed how material practices and biochemical reactions and the actual attention to the body and to the texts and the editing is, is crucial, right? So it's not all symbolic language, if you mean by that some kind of abstract language. I'm not sure that I understand what's symbolic. No, but, but, but you're excluding uh, the groups where the party or the discourse where the party is not always right. I'm so not excluding. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I showed how Leninism was edited, actually, in the Institute by nomenclatura. It was being edited. All those manuals were published. But, no, uh, my, but my point is not that you, you cannot focus just on that. You have to analyze all also the abstract entity, which is the oh. truth, to which they have to refer. Okay. They do have to refer to it. Yeah. I, I so it's not I mean. just symbolic, it's not just material. You have to bring those together. In, in between. All right. Uh, thank you. Not so in between. between. You have to bring both okay. of them. Okay. Bring yeah. them together. Uh, so there are a number of questions. And, and I apologize in advance if I won't be able to, to cover them all. But let me, let me, I probably will group them into, um, some some sort of useful clusters. Right? Yeah, so, I, I don't see the chat, so you just yeah. So so the the, the first uh, couple of uh, questions um, about uh, from Georgia Maggiore and Ross Hinman. Uh, the first question is: Why Lenin's body is still preserved? There is no Lenin's party anymore. So what's the point? Uh, just inertia. And uh, the 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 question that that somewhat is uh, Justin, can you could you speak? Uh, to how the Orthodox Church has responded to the project of uh, preserving Lenin's body in the post-Soviet era. Right. Mm -hmm. um, another question, and actually there is there is more than one question from uh, Sasha Sindirovich, hello Sasha, uh, and from Lee uh, about uh, your counter-argument vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Nina to Markin's work on Lenin and Lenin's cult. Uh, cult. Uh, would love to hear more about Professor Yurchak's argument with Nina Tumarkin's work on Lane's cult. And thank you for the fascinating talk, Professor Urchak. Could you please elaborate why you think Nina Tumarkin's interpretation is insufficient? Right. Um, so let's 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 answer these three questions and then, then I will prepare another question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So can you remind me what the, the first So one the was? first question was why the, the Lane's body is preserved uh, after the, the death oh, of the oh, Lenin's right. party. Okay. Uh, the second question was the about attitudes of the Orthodox Church to the preservation of Lenin and body in the post-Soviet period. And the third is about Nina Tumarkin. Thank you. Uh, so why it has been preserved after? Um, I think maybe we cannot approach this question by posing a counter question. Why wouldn't it be preserved uh, in order for it not to be preserved, there has to be a decision that this is clearly something wrong. Uh, it's connected to a history which has been shown to be wrong. And therefore, we need to, uh, like it's done, for example, in the decommunization uh, laws in Ukraine and in some parts of Eastern Europe, we have to get rid of those uh, sites, symbols, uh, mm -hmm. practices which are associated with the political system of the past. Uh, that is not necessarily le legally done, nor uh, I, I don't think it should automatically be expected to be done in any place in the world, let alone uh, in, in post Soviet Putin's Russia. Um, so to decide that this has to be taken away, I mean, there are many voices that are always in April. Um, 
at the time of the anniversary of Lincoln's birth, there's all these debates in the media what to do and why it's still there. And I always wonder, and why should it not be there? Uh, history is not, like when we talk about rupture, we don't mean that sub something is completely erased as a blank slate and we start something new. Of course not. There's a lot of continuities to this. Um, some of them are scientific constitu institutional cons uh, continuities to which I referred as the word inertia, but some of them are decisions of the state. The state wasn't involved very much with the mausoleum for quite a while. Uh, already in the 80s during prehistoric, it wasn't. Um, there is, however, another dimension to this, to all of that. Uh, and, and that is to make a decision now that Lenin's mausoleum has to be raised, or at least that Lenin's body has to be taken out of it. It would suggest that um, the whoever makes the decision, presumably the leaders of the state, of the contemporary state, make a statement, not only to its own population, but to, to history, in the face of history, that we, by doing this, we agree with the particular version of uh, Soviet history, particular interpretation, which says that that history was wrong. And therefore we need to amend the mistake, which these 70 years were by taking it out. That kind of statement is extremely difficult to make because it actually plays uh, within the larger global context of interests and uh, versions of what socialism is. And I think it's because of that, that they don't want to make that kind of statement. Uh, it's often justified by saying there are a lot of people who are still, uh, you know, whose life uh, was associated with the socialist project and the, the elderly people for them, it would be very traumatic. I think that's also true, but I don't think that's the main reason. The main reason is uh, kind of reticence about admitting that with this act, we are say, we're amending something. And it's not obvious to me that this act will actually be an amendment. I think it, it will be, be agreeing with some version of history and that version of history, usually liberal, usually kind of Western version is not necessarily, um, you know, without its own critical points. I think if you want to hear my opinion, which is completely irrelevant because no one is asking my opinion, but I'll just say it anyway. Uh, it would be really nice to have that place uh, uh, preserved and Lenin's body still there and the, and the lab can continue working. It's, it doesn't take that much effort and financial support, regardless of what the media sometimes says, it's not very expensive. Um, but you can, one can create a memorial there to the whole history of the Soviet Union all the crimes and all the ethical projects and all the goods and bads. And, if, and having Lenin's monument, Lenin's body there as part of that memorial would be potentially quite interesting and uh, productive. But uh, I'm sure there are many counter arguments to this. Now, um, the second question was about... Um, the church's attitude in the post. Oh, the church. Um, I don't know. I, I'm also kind of curious why should the uh, attitude of the church be somehow privileged among the attitudes of other institutions? The church has different voices. Most of the post-Soviet version of the church claims are different than what the church used to say before. So now it is often said that this is against the Orthodox tradition, which is, you know, you can argue both ways. You can say that you know, Orthodox tradition, just like Catholic or Buddhist has a lot of relics uh, this is not a relic, as I said, but you, you can make that argument, as Putin recently did. Well, we have them in, in monasteries, bodies, why not here? Some uh, people in the church, like Kurai, for example, as far as I know, are not necessarily very up in arms against this. So I don't think there is a one uh, organized opinion about it. Um, and I don't think... Let's move on to the next one. We have more yeah, questions. It is connected, actually. You know, okay, guys, so I'll, I'll be fast. I, I, I get carried away. I'll try to answer th things shorter. So in terms of Nina Dumarkin's argument about relics, as I said, from the very beginning, it was very important to distance, distant, uh, publicly distance this project from any religious associations. They stressed all the time, this is part of the scientific 
uh, experiment. This is a great achievement of Soviet science. It was all over the media in the, in the 20s and 30s. Even though the actual procedures were kept secret, the knowledge that it's done by scientists, and it's the opposite of religious, was important. And also, as I said, it's very important to pay, you make, can make the argument like to Markin without actually knowing what's going on. You just look at the body, it looks like a relic, and then you can make this argument. I don't think it's enough for historical analysis to do that. You, you have to actually understand what it is that you're looking at, how it is created, what, what are the practices behind it. And it turns out that the materiality of this body is the opposite of the relic, because any religious relic actually changes its look. It, it becomes dry, brittle. It, it doesn't look like the person at all. It's a mummy, right? Or sometimes relics are just bones and nothing else. Here, it's the opposite. You recreate the form, the shape, the supplements by substituting a biometal with something else. So you're creating kind of the, uh, the, the opposite thing. Um, uh, besides this whole argument about religious uh, meanings invested into this body in, in the 20s, I think is actually very problematic in terms of evidence. I'm, I'm sure that some people who, who invested that body with that meaning, but no, by and large, it wasn't the case. And that's based on purely archival knowledge. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. And once again, sorry for interrupting you. So we have two questions, one from uh, Elijah Lamakin and another from Lena and Sasha Prokhorov uh, about the current uh, symbolic status of Lenin's body in present day Russia and uh, whether it, it still has a uh, symbolic status, or maybe, maybe uh, a transformed one and perhaps uh, Elijah suggests uh, public debates about burying the Lenin's body uh, emerging in Russia from time to time, they do reflect the symbolic status. Yeah, uh, I think I kind of at least started answering this question when I talked about the, uh, when I un try, try to answer the first question, why it's not buried, right? Why it's still there. And uh, I said that it's still there because uh, not having it there is a very big decision. Not having it there is a decision which is not about Lenin, not about his body, but about a particular interpretation of history, a particular gesture towards the past, towards all sorts of, uh, for many people, ethical, maybe blind, or maybe mistaken, but ethical commitments which they lived with, right? And to say that those commitments were all a big mistake and that your lives have to be deleted and that now we'll start from good, from good place. It is an extremely violent, uh, extremely problematic statement, right? R regardless of what you think about the and, and Soviet system. So to make that kind of statement, any state, I mean, it's, it's like in the United States. Do United States make this kind of statement about its racialized history, which build American modernity? This history of slavery. It's very difficult to make that kind of statement. You, of course, you recognize that that was evil past, but you don't uh, reduce everything to that because clearly it would be a very mistaken reduction. So it's the same here. So I think that's a symbolic status. It doesn't play the symbolic, the political role within the system of sovereign power uh, as it used to. It doesn't play the role of that figure uh, through which the voice of Lenin speaks as I outlined, as it used to, but it plays this new role, right, in relation to history. And it's very difficult to get rid of it for that reason. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alexei. Uh, the question from Dina Feinberg. Um, uh, thank you I know much. many of these names, but- Of course, of course. Some that's folks why, I'm, that's I'm why not, I'm naming them. And some so, folks, so, I just wanted to say there were some folks who included in my, I'm, I'm not personally um, acquainted, so. Yes. But, but I'm happy to, 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 to call the names of friends and distant friends. Um, so uh, Dina writes, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Could you please discuss the meaning of Lenin's body outside the party and the scientific circles in the different segments of Soviet public? Uh, I, I can imagine that that would be a subject of a different talk, but the call is yours. No, uh, I, I think it would be, it, it's part of the uh, bigger, chapter on which the talk is based. Uh, and uh, I think the role would be similar because if you think about the practices of visiting the mausoleum, this long lines uh, and um, the uh, 
transformation of, of these practices uh, in late prehistoria and right after when there was an almost overnight, not overnight, very, in a very short period of time, a disappearance of these practices, erasure. And now looking back without a kind of cynical smile, it's almost impossible. Like what, what are these strange people in the lines doing? And that to me is, and also, you know, the uh, way of talking about Lenin in the kind of respect Respectful way in the past, regardless again what you thought about Lenin, you could joke about Lenin, you could repeat anecdotes, but nevertheless it was a figure which occupied a special position. And now talking about this horrible, smelly corpse which is still lying in the center of the country, how possible, what are we doing, how crazy, and so forth. To me, this switch from kind of reverence, not necessarily believe, but reverence to complete. Um, abhorrence is exactly the switch which happens to the sacred object. That's what, as anthropologists have been showing from time immemorial all over the, the world, the, the sacred is constructed as a double-sided thing. It is both something extremely positive, something which you cannot touch without dirtying, and it also has the other side, which you cannot touch without dirtying yourself. Right, and that's exactly what happened to Lenin. So it, it occupied the place of, of of the sacred, and as we know from people like um, Aristotle, but of course from people like Agamben, more recently, the sacred and the sovereign are linked. They are both occupied outside, like Homo Sacra, outside the political, right, in that place which you cannot question, to which everything everything has to refer, but you cannot really quite touch and question it. Like, like you suggested to do with nomenclatura, and I refused, I said, no, we need to still preserve that external place, the sacred, right? And that's the abstract party. So in, from that position, uh, answering Dina's question about relationship to Lenin, the, I think the relationship of the common people, quote unquote, was to, to an object which is sacred, which doesn't mean that they believe in it. That's not about belief, it's not about, uh, listening to every word of Lenin is most people didn't care. They had to conspectirovich Lenin in the institutes, but not paying attention. But it was still something untouchable. And that's why those long lines to the mausoleum it was interesting. It was something you visited a particular site, right? And it, and that's exactly why right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it became a, a site of total um, hatred or something evil, something which now can be spoken of in the, in the in the language is, which is the opposite of the sacred. And that's the other side of the sacredness. Thank you, thank you, Xi. So here are two questions. Uh, one from um, Yon Mora um, asking uh, whether uh, Mao's, uh, Mao, Mao Zedong's body in Beijing uh, serves similar function as Lenin's body in the Soviet Union, which, mm -hmm. which may be a separate question, of course, um, a separate study. Um, and another question is from Michel Gaspari, uh, who um, writes, thank you, Dr. Rurchak. I'm interested in your laboratory ethnography. How did those maintaining the living sculpture talk about themselves and their work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a again, um, thank you so much for this wonderful questions. Again, Mark, this is not a, a different study. There's a whole chapter which is devoted to Mao and the other bodies. Right. Um, you didn't know that. And, and the reason for that is that uh, you cannot quite understand uh, Lenin's body without thinking about those other bodies and what happened. Um, there are 10 bodies around the world which were preserved by the mausoleum lab, and Mao's body was not one of them. The Chinese preserved Mao's body on, on their own because at that time in 1976, when he died, the relations between the Soviet Union and China were at their worst, right? The split. And so uh, Mao was preserved as, in, in a nutshell, I have a long argument, of course, but in a nutshell, and I can show it um, archivally as well, uh, the Chinese wanted to insist that they are the ones who continue Leninism. The Soviets actually betrayed it, right? Which is why the split. There was a so-called Leninist polemic, which was published in the Chinese newspapers in the late 60s, and was the Soviet Union and China uh, textually arguing about Leninism. So China was the, con the continuator of Leninism, and Mao uh, plays a different role than Lenin. It plays the role of a, of a symbol which is referring to Lenin's body. 
right? And by embalming Mao, they actually preserve this link. And it's for the same reason that the Soviets preserved all these other bodies around the globe, in uh, North Korea, in Vietnam, in uh, uh, Angola, in Guyana, in uh, Czechoslovakia, in Bulgaria. In Mongolia, it failed, but there was an attempt to do it in Mongolia and so forth. Um, also, all of those bodies play a role of, they wouldn't be there if Lenin's body wasn't in, in, in the mausoleum. They, they don't play the same role in the structure of the sovereign power in, in their states. They all refer to Lenin, right? Including Mao, as I said, because of the split. Now, the second question was about the, uh, uh, the lab and the, I'm sorry. I cannot hear you, Mark. I think you are muted. No, no, you are muted. Yes, of course, uh, I'm muted. Uh, about lab ethnography and about how yeah, yeah. the scientists are talking about this project. Again, uh, th there's a huge chunk about that, of course. Uh, there's a chapter called the lab and it was very difficult to actually get into that lab. It's extremely secretive, it's closed. And uh, I think now in the post-Soviet years, it's partly closed because uh, there's an attempt, just like with Lenin's body, as I was saying earlier, to laugh at them, to trivialize, to to basically turn the whole thing into, into a big circus. There's lots of documentaries made about it, and in the 90s there were articles written. So since then, they try to keep all of that at bay. So for me, as an anthropologist, it took a lot of time to kind of prove to the scientists, not everyone wanted to talk to me, but those who did, uh, uh, two of whom I just showed, and there were about eight people altogether. Uh, they had to, after a while, understand that I'm not going to be participating in that kind of uh, ridicule or trivialization that I, I, I just wanted to understand. And in fact, people like Lapuhin and Gazeltsev, Lapuhin in particular, the one of the people who, who was in the slide, and that goes directly to the question. He told me several times after we already knew each other for years that he agreed to talk to me and then was convinced by after our first meeting that he wanted to figure out for the for himself how to think about this project more um, expansively than just a scientific and political kind of little ritual. So he wanted to understand what was going on that no one articulated, right? Because my argument is that the symbolic meaning, the political meaning of this uh, project is not necessarily the one which someone articulated first and then it emerged, right? It emerged on its own. He was really interested in that. He kind of a, a philosopher. He was an academician, extremely uh, well-educated and interesting person. Most of the scientists, by the way, the key ones, they work in different institutes around, around Moscow. They're not only working in the mausoleum lab. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alexei. Um, Sasha uh, Sindirovich responds uh, to your commentary about uh, Tumarkin's argument on the Tumarkin church static relic questions that kind of view of Lenin's body is so ingrained that it takes a second for uh, Professor Richard's convincing argument about dynamism to land. Thanks. So, so things are happening. Right. Uh, Polina Dimova and I actually we have a similar question. Polina um, writes, thank you for a fascinating talk. What is the aesthetics of Lenin's living sculpture and what was Soviet art? and culture developed around Lenin's body, uh, in parenthesis, Kitaev's fate. My idea came, uh, used similar name, uh, similar, uh, similar question, but uh, uh, different examples. So, so when you uh, mentioned living sculptures, I immediately thought of uh, Pyotr Pavlensky, who, who exactly creates living sculptures. And of course, his most famous living sculpture was made right in front of the Lenin's mausoleum uh, and called Fixture, uh, as you remember. And uh, lots of things, actually, that, that, that you are saying when, when you start thinking about Pavlensky from the perspective of uh, Lenin's body, uh, his living sculpture is sort of an attempt to take away the mortal body, right? Sort of to, to reappropriate the mortal body. Do you think that, that that's uh, just a coincidence or maybe he and other artists read your works? Or is there some kind of symbolic logic in, in, in work? Yeah, I'm actually always, um, I will start with the second question, but I think um, Alina's question is written into yours, so maybe I'll... Yes, so I, I, I united them into one question. Them. Yeah, Polina yeah. Would, I hope Polina will excuse me for that. Sorry, Polina. So uh, basically what, uh, well, I will answer both. Uh, I 
wanted to say that I'm always a little bit um, suspicious, maybe the word, in the terms of, uh, in quote unquote suspicious, careful about drawing this kind of parallels because Pavlinsky and another artistic practice is designed to be artistic, to, to be uh, in the realm of artistic commentary on. And when I use the word living sculpture, or rather when Lepuhin, talking to me, used the word Jovaya Scriptura, he um, arrived at that definition not by thinking about Lenin, preservation of Lenin as an artistic project. It was definitely not an artistic project. And for him, that term is something which makes him a little bit cringe. And he has to explain that, of course, it's not really that he's inventing that word for lack of a better word. We even played with the word from Nikola Realists. I told him about Nitrup, which was coined by Yufit. And he was like, well, maybe, maybe it's a better term. In other words, for him, um, the, the, uh, the driving uh, rationale behind inventing a term like this is not to highlight the aesthetic side of it and not to highlight an artistic gesture. Right, which is different from Pavlensky, right? So that's why I wouldn't necessarily draw this analogy too, too directly. And I'm, um, I, nevertheless, I would like to answer uh, Paulina's question uh, in a different way. Uh, the aesthetics of this body, it has played an extremely, I mean, the whole analysis which I suggested that this materiality is actually located in, in the side outside and that reproducing the exact physicality of this body is very important, right? That, that you can substitute materials, but the body's form has to be the same. It played an extremely important role in the aesthetic project of Leniniana. All the first sculptures of Lenin were produced with the help of the death mask. And in fact, there was a uh, unwritten uh, principle that the death mask had to be used in sculptures. And the death mask was of course directly, like you can think about the body as, a, as full body death mask of Lenin, in a sense, right? This uh, touch, the original touch to the, to, the, uh, to the body itself, the physical link to it, which is uninterrupted, which propagates through all the aesthetic forms, through all the pictures, and through all the sculptures is very important. So the body and all its representations outside are actually not just external representations, but direct uh, physical extensions of it. So from that point of view, the body plays extremely important role aesthetically, right? Uh, and uh, that also justifies the use of the term uh, living sculpture, which uh, Lepuhin coined, but again, not as an artistic gesture in the sense of Pavlinsky. Okay, okay but, but uh, you, you do not reject the, the idea of certain sort of inspiration coming from Lenin's body to, to those post-Soviet projects, right? Well, I, I think inspiration comes from from all over the place. Uh, I'm not sure that there's something which I would privilege here. Somehow Lenin's body makes us special and our deformative art special. I'm not so sure about that. Okay, so here are, um, I will try to, 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 to summarize a few questions and, and probably I think we will we'll need to wrap it up because you're working for, for almost 100 minutes now. And so, so we need to give you some some rest. So um, Ilya Lamakin of um, Moscow asks about the role of uh, bodies buried in the necropolis behind the mausoleum, uh, whether they contribute anyhow to the construction of Lenin's body. And Mikhail Moravsky asks uh, the question, so, so uh, the, the first part you already partially answered there. The first question is what what should be done with the mausoleum? So you mentioned that it, it may become a part of the sort of Soviet past museum. But here comes another question. Do you think, uh, or, or how would you think it will be plugged into sanitized uh, uh, sort of uh, Blagostroy's escape of Sabianian's Moscow? W would there be a room for, for this object, right? Uh, in, in this new Moscow that we are observing now. And uh, a, part of, uh, a part of this is the question that was asked earlier, uh, whether um, you can see the sort of uh, consumerization of, 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 of this object becoming a part of the industry of tourism. I think this, all these questions are interconnected and maybe you can find the way to, to answer them mm -hmm. all together. 
Thank you. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll, I'll start with, with the second, with Mikhail's question. Hi, Nicole. Um, basically, um, it's, I think it's not the same thing to talk about the um, uh, extraction of the body from the mausoleum and the burial, right? And the getting rid of the mausoleum as a structure. Those are kind of separate questions. They might be linked, but not necessarily. And I don't see, even if Lenin's body is taken out of the mausoleum and buried eventually, which may happen, I think the decision to get rid of the mausoleum would, would be much harder. And partly because it is such an uh, organic part of the Red Square. It's actually an extremely beautiful building and it's really, in my opinion, well written into the square. So uh, Sabanian's transformation of certain parts of Moscow I can, can't see how it would touch that site, that uh, the significance to that site, which goes beyond just the body itself. So I imagine that it would remain there, but I cannot predict obviously anything. Uh, in terms of the connection between this, uh, the decision to build the mausoleum and the Berlinian in this site to the, uh, to the uh, tombs of the, uh, fighters for the revolution originally in, uh, in Moscow and then which were already there before and then of course all the other uh, burial sites of the state behind um, it it was chosen the place was chosen because they were already well, first of all because it's in the center because it's close to Kremlin and because they were already um, mass burials of the revolutionary bodies there so that was one of the arguments when they were choosing the place. Uh, and uh, it is also one of the arguments of people who are trying to protect the mausoleum. There's a public organization called Mausoleum, and they donate money to this lab, and they are very active. And many of them are actually business people. They're not necessarily pensioners with no money for the donating a little bit. Some people are donating a lot of money. Uh, they, their relationship to history, I guess, is more... Uh, different from the majority. So they um, argue that it's very difficult to move the body and the mausoleum from that site precisely because it would involve uh, hundreds of other bodies. Like why move this but not the rest? There's a whole uh, pantheon there, right? Ne necropolis. Uh, and that makes, that is something which I forgot to say in the beginning. It makes also the decision on Lenin's body somewhat more difficult, right? Because if you start moving bodies out, then you would have to make a lot of decisions. And there are a lot of families involved, a lot of histories involved. There's a huge necropolis behind. That makes, that anchors it all much more profoundly in that site. All right. And the very last question from Lena Adashev of Yale University. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I wonder if we could think about innumerable Lenin's monuments across the post-Soviet space as a continuation of this double body of Lenin. Yeah, and I already, thank you, Lena. I already started answering this question that most sculptures uh, can actually be traced either through the death mask or through the copy of a copy of a copy of a death mask. And I've done a lot of uh, research among sculptors. So I have a chapter about sculptures, just to tell you. <laughs> You see, Mark, I have a chapter about every question. <laughs> I have 30 chapters. Anyway, no, uh, but uh, so yes, uh, it was like a propagation of form. If you think about that body and living sculpture as a form which has been reproduced over and over and over, and it's very important to reproduce that form because it's actually the embodied anchor of that sovereign outside of the political system. Then the propagation of that form happens through images and uh, sculptures, and they all are traced quite physically quite directly through the masks to the body. And, it, and this is also why it can be a site of such symbolic violence, like Lenin apart in Ukraine, right? Why Lenin becomes a site of that uh, attack. And, and I already answered that question about the, the, the sacred, right? Which has two sides to it. And it can flip flop when, when the uh, symbolic parameters of the system change something which was considered to be untouchable can become un untouchable in the other sense. You cannot touch it. It's so dirty, right? It's the opposite. It's still untouchable, but it acquires a different, um, a different vector. It becomes something which can actually pollute you. And this is why all these attacks 
and so absolutely all this all these images all these sculptures all this um, uh, sites of uh, associated with Lenin become extremely focused uh, precisely because they all link to that body um, uh, they all link to the sacred sovereign okay. I can't hear you again no can you hear now no. all right all right uh, thank you thank you Alexei, for the wonderful talk and for the wonderful uh, answers to the question you were answering for the questions for another hour so 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 you it, it, it's I, I think more than than we could expect we had wonderful crowd we had wonderful questions thank you everyone who came to this lecture it i think it was a success and uh, i think we should repeat it again the format sort of proved to be working thank you thank you thank you and let's say again thank you thank you so much thank you everyone for the wonderful questions there and for letting me um articulate answers because it's always so helpful um thank you